earlier, my colleague Steve Clements had a chance to speak with Congresswoman Diana DeGette from Colorado, who chairs the Diabetes Caucus and is a leading diabetes advocate on Capitol Hill. She also serves as chair of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Let's take a listen. Representative DeGette, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as we've just been discussing, you and I have talked about uh, diabetes before, what this country needs to do to make, you know, uh, uh, just improve. Uh, this is a, a, a condition that is hitting so many Americans who need support and help. And I'm just interested, you you have lived this experience. You're, you're chair of the Diabetes Caucus. What is missing out there in terms of the planks of support that we really should be thinking about from a public policy perspective? Well, as you know, and Steve, thank you so much for being with me again. I'm uh, it's lab a labor of love to do these talks. I think that that we need to continue to double down on our efforts both to find a cure for type one diabetes and also for type two diabetes to find the appropriate treatments and prevention. Those are those are the two issues. And that means uh, more targeted money in biomedical research. That means uh, better drugs and devices and faster approval through the FDA and then through CMS and, and really focusing in on trying to not just manage this disease, but really to try to cure it. You know, one of the areas of concern that I have looking at this is to look at the research dollars going into diabetes, what's going on in this arena. And, and, and when you compare this realm, say you were to basically put a sandbox around it and say this is, and you compare it to other areas where we've made incredible advances, you know, my concern is that when, you know, are, are we doing what we really could be doing? Because this, this doesn't seem to be keeping up with the rest of science, the rest of biomedical research. Why has it fallen back in your view? Well, obviously we have the special diabetes program, which I spearheaded now. It's It's been almost 20 years, I think, since we first started doing it. And it has been a great influx of research dollars into the NIH. But yet I think we need we just need to do more. One of the things I'm so excited about is I'm working with Congressman Fred Upton, who I worked with five years ago on the 21st Century Cures Act to target the way we do biomedical research and then to find um, and then to find ways to approve drugs and devices. Now we are working on Cures 2.0 to help even more with a patient-centered approach, but we're also working to authorize this really big idea that President Biden had, which is to create an agency called ARPA-H. And ARPA-H right. will is modeled on DARPA. And what it will do is it will be lean and mean. It will not have the same kind of constraints that our normal research agencies have. And it will be tasked with finding cures for diseases like diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, things that we just haven't been able to get over the finish line. And we're excited about it. The administration put $2 billion in their budget this year for it. And so what Fred and I want to do is, is give the authorization to the agency. So we'll have a director, we'll have folks. And so it will work in collaboration and conjunction with the NIH not to replace or to siphon off from the NIH. And, and just so our audience follows, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They're sort of the WIDS kids of really novel, incredible, fast, out of the box thinking in the defense side. And we've had a similar one in the Department of Energy uh, called ARPA E, and so ARPA H, what I've you know discussed with Congressman Upton, would be you know again looking at these out of the box, almost next generation solutions. Is that do I have that about right? That's exactly right. And I mean DARPA, they they invented the internet, you know, and and, and the concept is you bring people in, you give them a task, they think big, and then they come up with unconventional solutions. So it doesn't substitute for the basic research that we're doing, but it brings in some of the most creative and experienced minds, scientists, and helps them f find these solutions. I think maybe that's some of the way we need to think about diabetes. I, I talked to some of the advocates and researchers, and people really have some 
very unusual and exciting ideas for how we could actually cure diabetes. And so I think that we need to really explore some of those as well as what we're doing. Okay, another part of this story that's kind of unfortunate right now, because it's also part of the COVID story. It's part of the uh, fact that any disease, any chronic disease hits different communities in America unevenly. Um, you have disproportionate share, you know, depending on where you live, what zip code you're in, what race you may be. And, and when it comes to insulin pumps and glucose monitors, you know, I'm just interested in what we need to think through so that people can afford what they need to, um, to, to deal with this challenge and, and what we, not just the federal government, but what we in society, what levels that we all ought, ought to be thinking of different models of providing that kind of support for people who may not have easy access or be able to afford this healthcare, um, vital healthcare element. Well, I mean, all of the technology is, is incredible these days. Uh, we've talked before, my daughter, Francesca, yeah. she's 27 now. She was four when she was diagnosed and she has so much equipment that if you asked me to, to do it, I probably would be at a loss these days, even though yeah. I was the main manager of her diabetes for many years. Yeah. And so everybody should be able to have, you're exactly right. Everybody should be able to have that same access. What that means is that, CMS needs to authorize the equipment, the the diet, the pumps, and everything else that goes along with it, and make sure that that it's that access to the highest quality healthcare for diabetics isn't just based on socioeconomics or on race. And so that's part of what actually we have a whole section in our Cures, Cures 2.0 bill mm. that Fred and I are doing to restructure CMS so it really moves more quickly to approve these things. Some of the issues that we've had around diabetes with CMS are just mind boggling where they'll approve one insulin pump but not another because of the way they uh, are structured technologically. And I mean, it's it just, mm. and, and, and you know, the people at CMS, they recognize that a lot of it is because of the way rules are wit written or statutes sure. are written. So we're trying to clear up some of that, that uh, bureaucracy. No, I mean, you and Fred Upton, you know, Congressman Upton, I should tell you, and a Republican congressman from Michigan, a Democratic congresswoman from Colorado are doing so much on science. I mean, I just want to be, you know, just, just tip my hat because you're doing so much on science in a bipartisan way. Does anybody tell you to stop playing across the aisle on this? I mean, who's, who's, do they say, hey, don't succeed? Can't stop winning so much? No, they no, because you know what? Disease doesn't affect Democrats or Republicans or unaffiliated. It affects every family in America. And this is one reason why Fred and I really love working on this together, is because we feel that we get eager support, not just from our colleagues, but from patients and researchers and and angel investors and, and uh, advocacy groups. You know, we get we get uh, we get support from everybody, and people love that we are able to do something in a bipartisan way. You they tweeted, yeah, you tweeted out a week ago uh, on October eighteenth. You wrote, "Nothing about Gail's insulin has changed, but its price has gone up by more than six hundred percent. She's not alone. The skyrocketing price of insulin is affecting millions of Americans who need this life sustaining drug. It's time for Congress to lower drug costs now." How is that going? You've laid it out very starkly what's happening, yeah. what the person is feeling, you know, what the person affected with diabetes is feeling um, in this process and, and, and these, you know, large costs. And I'm just interested in how we're tackling that ecosystem if we are. So, so um, the person I was referring to in that tweet is a constituent of mine named Gail DeVore, who's a wonderful activist. But this same thing happened to my daughter, Francesca. When she was 26, she, she was on my health insurance and her insulin was $35 a bottle. And then when she turned 27, she went on her employer's um, health care and she went in to get her prescription and they said that'll be $350 for real. That happened to her. The same insulin, different insurance plan. And, and diabetics across the country are really facing this. Some of the insulin, some of the pharmaceutical companies and manufacturers have been trying to find a way to 
to make insulin available more cheaply, but it's not widely known and it's not widely utilized. And that's why I've, I've uh, continually been sponsoring bipartisan legislation on insulin pricing uh, with the House uh, Caucus Diabetes Caucus and the Senate Diabetes Caucus to say that insulin can't go beyond $35 a vial. I mean, after all, if people don't take their insulin, they die. And so, you know, it's it's sort of existential. And we held off for a while reintroducing our bill, our, ins our insulin price reduction bill, waiting to see what happened with HR3, which is the drug pricing bill. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and elements of that bill are included in the Build Back Better plan. But, but I don't uh, know if it will survive into the final bill. And if not, we're really going to make a big push to, to pass this legislation. And I, I actually think insulin pricing can act as a model for other types of essential drugs. So if we don't pass it in, in, in the Build Back Better bill, you can expect to see our legislation. Representative Deget, just finally, um, one of the elements of this of this discussion, which we don't often, we recently did a forum on obesity, and obesity in many ways is tied to the diabetes challenge uh, as well. And you know, one other element that I just worry about with anyone that's living with a chronic disease and struggling to feel the card stacked against them, whether they're type one or type two, is what we as a society, your insights as a mom and as a person in society, maybe as a legislator, but, but more importantly, as a human being who cares about others, I mean, elements of stigma, elements of like how hard it is for folks to be dealing with this, that we ought to be thinking about as we discuss real people suffering with this challenge. Well, so, so for people with type one diabetes, of course, as you know, it's an autoimmune disease. And so yeah. what happens is it's usually triggered by some kind of illness and then your body loses the ability to make the, to, to, you know, to make the insulin. And so that's why you have to have it. And, and, um, uh, and for those folks, there was a lot of stigma. And I think that we just need to take it, take it out and and not make it um, not make it a secret anymore. Francesca, right. who's 27 years old, she wears her continuous glucose monitor right up there on her arm with her sleeveless blouses, and she, and and we've always raised her not to feel ashamed of having an autoimmune disease. With respect to type two diabetes, which can have obesity as a factor, again. Um, I have relatives who have two, type 2 diabetes, and they were actually told by physicians, well, you know, if you just lose some weight, you'll probably do better. And, and it's just sort of like, really? You yeah. think they didn't know that? And so I do think we have to start treating all of these diseases like diseases and think about working with patients in a patient-centered way about how we can solve them. Well, Representative Diana DeGette from Colorado, uh, chair of the Diabetes Caucus, I couldn't agree with you more. I really love your tweets. Um, this one was so moving. You know, you're paying tribute to, I think it's Lila Moss, who also worked Walk the Ramp wearing her insulin. Uh, uh, and I just wow. want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you so Kate much Moss's for what you're daughter. doing. That's Kate Moss's yeah. daughter. Wow. Wow. And so it was, it's just great. It's very inspiring to read your tweets. So, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying you following you on, on everything, but, but thank you so much for joining us uh, on this important topic. Thanks for having me. This is really an important topic and I'm looking forward to where we go from here.